Good morning. Notice how much more animated things are when you get up and move. <laughs> Hippocrates said, uh, not to me personally, but one time, that uh, motion is life. and Life is motion. And so there's an absolute necessity for us to be able to move. And, you know, I'm very privileged and I'm very grateful to be here today with you and also to share the platform with some of the most knowledgeable and skilled and dedicated researchers in this area. I think it's fairly clear to say that, you know, there's controversy, you know, and it would be fair to say there's controversy in science and healthcare. And these are very dedicated and passionate people. You know, we're very much dedicated to finding a solution to a problem that really lives out on the edge. My background is really from a clinical practice point of view. And for 35 years, I've had the, the distinct honor and privilege to take care of patients. And so they come to me with a problem, <clears throat> seeking to find a more optimal way to live and a less discomfort, less you know, dysfunction in their system. And so in those 35 years, I'm sure I've cared for in excess of 20,000 patients. You know, and I've learned a few things from that experience. And about five, six, well, uh, probably now 10 years ago, I took on the project of research as well, because research is really organized inquiry. We're asking questions and we're wanting to understand what it is that we're looking at. So for all the things that we don't know, there's a few things that we do know. And we, that is me, and a group of people are looking at things a little differently. One thing that we do know is that their nature in the human body is always, always, always in a state of change. It is never static. It is never the same. So we don't look at the body in terms of disease process. I look at it as a pathophysiological dysfunction. You know, and so to name something and give it a name and then treat it is not necessarily within our traditional scope of practice. And it's not that we're immune to looking at names, but we look at what is it is that's going on in the body in its state of change. The other thing we know is that there's an intelligence within this body. You know, and it's not an intellectual thing, it's an intelligence. If you cut your finger, it's not something you choose that you need to figure out how to heal that. It'll innately take over and do its thing. It'll reorganize itself. It's driven towards that natural tendency. And it's an intelligence that activates and aligns things to a normal. One thing I do know is that a correction of the upper cervical spine, a very precise and complete correction, is critical to the function of the human body. And I've seen that in those 35 years and 20,000 plus patients. The changes have been profound. So when I say that, I say it as anecdotal, anecdotally, clinically, and now research-wise. There are low-tech natural ways to support the body's optimal function. And we do have a healthcare system that is oriented towards an allopathic or medical model, which is the predominant form of care in the world, not the only care. But its function is to actually categorize things, name things, and then prescribe things that would support its physiology. And there's absolutely no question there's m huge benefits to that support system. What we want to look at today, though, is some of the things that stand outside of that system that can also support normal, natural physiology, the intelligence that exists within the body, and that drive towards optimization. And each person will have a very unique experience, very personal in terms of their pain, their suffering, their life. You know, and that's why I think this presents one of the greatest challenges is into research. And as I'll talk to you a little bit more, is that you know, when we look at data and try and compare person to person, that's one thing. But there's also the unique experience that each person has and the changes that go on within that individual that also need to be understood. So we can't always compare a person to person. They may have a similar set of symptoms and conditions, and that's why it's been said many times over the last few days, including the change in the name of this organization to neurovascular disease because it encompasses so many things that have very similar types of problems. But it is always very different and very personal. 
So what I want to share is another way to look at MS. I want to talk to you about the impact of head and neck trauma on the nervous system and how that can affect MS. And also the research that we've done uh, that can further understand the pathophysiological mechanisms of CSF and supportive care strategies, things that can actually you do that are the low-tech things that might support your optimal physiology. So another way of looking at it, you know, most people ask the question, what's wrong here? For me, it's really a question of what's right about this. How did we get to where we are? You know, we all have a history from birth until this moment in time. You know, and what I've known is that certainly there are people who are born with particular predispositions and particular problems. And so the genetic predisposition is absolutely one of the considerations. But I see people who at one time in their life function normally. They were fine. They got through their days okay. Then something went sideways. So what happened there? You know, and science is doing an amazing job at a very microscopic level studying the physiology of what went wrong. But the story still needs to understand how did you get that way? And is it a coincidence or some fluke that you ended up like that? I don't think so. And so my experiences again point towards what is it and how did we get here that's right about it? And there may be some common themes in this. We do look for cause and effect. And the cause and effect relationship is a very important question. One thing that is common across our human journey from birth to death is that we will be demanded upon. Our system will be loaded. And so trauma in its very basic definition could be said an excessive load or force that exceeds the resilient capacity of that system, which goes back to the chains as strong as the weakest link. The effect of when the system gets overloaded, and that system can be overloaded both biomechanically, biochemically, environmentally, emotionally, cognitively. There's many ways, and if not all of those ways combined, that it total up the sum load on that system. So the question is resilience. So the effects that it has when that force or that load exceeds the capacity of the system, it ends traditionally in the first reactive stage of into, you know, the, the autonomic nervous system. Now, why do we even have a nervous system? The, auto, the nervous system, in fact, its prime function is to sense our environment, read the environment, and feed back to the body a way to make sure that we stay within our normal range. And I'll talk more about this, but that's called homeostasis, our innate natural drive towards equilibrium. So the nervous system's function is to read the environment both externally and internally and adapt us to whatever is going on. And there is a normal that works best, whether it's blood oxygen levels, blood sugar levels, postural levels, there is an optimal range. Trauma will have us deviate from that. Trauma in the sense that the system gets overloaded. So there's tissue reaction, there's physical reaction, there's emotional reactions, and there's cognitive changes that occur. <clears throat> so the question is, where do we look? Science looks for answers of cause and effect. Now, the question here is, if you're sitting in this audience and you're a patient or someone who is challenged by a health issue, you're going to ask different questions than a, a researcher who's sitting in this audience and is asking, where do we look? But we're still all looking for something that's really important. So not only where do we look, how do we look? And again, if you're a patient, it's really important to stay open-minded. And so the same thing for scientists. Curiously, we need to be curious about what's going on and stay open-minded. You know, within healthcare, within science, it is competitive, and there are controversies. It's not like that we're immune to that conversation. And the dedication of you and this organization to stand up and challenge conventional thought takes a tremendous amount of courage and effort. The compassionate part from a patient's point of view is really important. The capacity to blame ourselves for cause and effect is immense. And it's really important to not do that. For the self-blame and the judgment that can be carried. 
And the openness that we need, the kindness that we need, is critical in not only our patient care, our self-care, but in science as well. We did a migraine study uh, that I will talk to you about in greater detail. And in that study, we looked at a lot of different things. We looked at uh, vascular changes. We looked at their history of mild traumatic brain injury and head injuries. 82% of our patients had mild traumatic brain injury. So one of the things I really want to talk about is what happens in terms of cause and effect in terms of physical stress. You know, as we grow up, we have this 12 to 16 pound mass that sits on top of the first vertebrae called the atlas or C1. And the forces that it's subjected to throughout the course of our life are immense, including from the moment we step into this world. We don't step in, we actually slide into this world. Usually it's head first, not feet first. <clears throat> Eventually we slide into the world, we crawl through the world for a while, and then we stand up. But before we learn to navigate that standing up, we fall down a lot. And for any people who've had children, or for your own memory, how many times have we fallen and hit our head? But concussion and mild traumatic brain symptoms are, um, impact the physical, the cognitive, the emotional, and the sleep. All of the things that the symptoms of MS are revealing and are shared are shared by mild traumatic brain. <clears throat> So all the different ways in which we hurt ourselves. You know, there's an infinite number of ways. And for 35 years, I've heard some of the most amazing stories. That's a whole other topic. When we look at Canadian stats, you know, the a number per 100,000 is not, I'm not sure if this is because we all play hockey. So between 0 and 14, every kid's thrown out on the rink and they end, end up with a concussion or a head injury. So I can't say that that's what drives those stats. Now, the 35-plus group could be the ones that still play hockey. I'm not sure. But Canadians, you know, and the incidence of this at the last, um, when this was studied uh, a few years ago, that's what the diagnosed mild traumatic brain injuries were. And we'll go on from there. In the U.S., the stats aren't much different. They do lots of different things. The point here isn't the stats. The point is it's a common problem. And it's becoming more common as we learn how to diagnose it properly. World Health has looked at the, uh, most of these problems, 70 to 90 percent, are short term symptomatically. I'm going to emphasize symptomatically. So they may recover symptomatically to be fine until a few years later downstream something else starts going sideways. But due to underreporting, <clears throat> a lot of them are missed. The estimates of incidence of concussion that are artificially low simply because 25% fail to get assessed by anyone medically. A retrospective study in 05 suggested that 88% are unrecognized in terms of emergency room visits. Just like MS, just like other neurodegenerative issues, the missed diagnosis is high. The early warning signs are missed because they're not trained to really look for those things. And if you've watched and you've probably seen in the media the importance of how to recognize and treat concussion, mild traumatic brain, head injuries is on the uprise immensely, which is the best news I've heard ever. In another study, they looked at some of these people had issues, both decline in mental, uh, physical and mental, uh, for longer than 30 years. So there are long-term effects of that. And those were people who also had episodic memory and reduced muscle speed. You know, so there's a, you know, there's a body of work that still has to be done. You know, and the symptoms of, you know, mild traumatic brain um, are very similar to that of MS in terms of there's such a, a crossover. You know, and I think that's why it's important that we look at this as neurodegenerative stuff and not label it so much one condition or another. Because these symptoms are shared across a lot of people. And I have a lot of patients who come in presenting with a lot of these symptoms who don't report and have never been diagnosed with MS or don't report that, a, a recognized head injury that they can think of. Also one of the challenges, um, the prognosis is different um, from adults and children. 
know, when you think of a developing brain, an early brain that gets traumatized, um, they have a harder time mediating that inflammatory response at times. There's so much neural networking being laid down in those first years of life um, that it's much more difficult for them to recover from some of these things. And the challenge is very little research has been done in the pediatric realm. So there's a need, there's an essential need for early detection and correction. If there's one thing that I've learned in 35 years, it's to get these children in assessed and corrected early in life. I treat a number of young injuries, head injuries now, uh, simply because of what we learned from our research. And these are, you know, 12, 13, 14-year-old children who walking around the block is fatiguing, who can't go to school because their cognitive function is so compromised. And a year later, 12 months later after, you know, a treatment protocol, they are normal functioning kids. And then two or three years out, there's no residual problems. So there are things that can be done that are you know, very safe, very low tech, and extremely beneficial. So you've heard the song, the head bones connected to the neck bone. In this area, in this conversation about head injury and neck injury, people have this idea that a head injury is just the head. But every time there's a head injury, there's a neck injury. I was at a conference in New York uh, last year which focused on uh, MRI imaging of the craniocervical region or the upper cervical spine. And I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Joseph Maroon, who is the neurosurgeon for the Pittsburgh Steelers, co-creator of the IMPACT test, which is a baseline concussion evaluation test. He also wrote the return to play guidelines for the NFL concussion. <clears throat> and I had that direct conversation with him. And after a while, it started to sink in that head and neck injuries are one and the same. And you don't have to lose consciousness to have a concussion. You don't have to lose consciousness to have a neck injury. A whiplash incident will accelerate and decelerate the head within the cranium that alters the upper cervical spine and creates a dysfunction. And that dysfunction of the upper cervical spine will lead to all sorts of other problems, which we're going to talk about. <clears throat> One of the impacts of the what we call the atlas or C1 subluxation complex, a subluxation being a big word for a very small misalignment. And that creates a stress on that central nervous system. It impairs the postural uh, muscles of the spine. And as a result of the subluxation, we see postural deviation. This is a patient who's volunteered kindly. She has one of these most excessive things. And you could say, well, she's just standing that way. Well, she is just standing that way. If she closes her eyes, her neutral posture is extremely distorted. There's also evidence that now, and this is the other exciting thing, you know, and, and having the privilege of hearing uh, Dr. Hakey and Dr. Uh, Zvidnov uh, speak about the research that they're doing, and it's just such depth. And the exciting thing is that we now have technology, recent technology, that enables us to really understand what's going on, but not in a static way, but in a dynamic way. You know, and so up to this point, taking an MRI or CT of the brain as a photograph could be interesting, but what's more relevant and interesting for me is the dynamic flow studies that are available today. This is what's really critical, and advancing it to the point where it moves out of a research tool to a clinical application is where I think it absolutely has to go. But the interesting thing about what we've seen so far in these MRI studies is that MS, migraine, and MTI, MTBI seem to have similar vascular issues. You know, when we look at those studies, you know, when we stand up, normally the, uh, <clears throat> the blood is drained through the secondary route. When we lie down, the primary jugulars are supposed to drain the blood. And there's probably a very logical, intelligent reason why. Some of it was alluded to in terms of the evacuation of toxicity of the brain at night. 99.9% .9 of the MRI scanners on the planet are people lying down, so we're scanning them lying down. There's the odd, there's a, in a, some innovative technology where they're sitting up, but again, what this points to for me is that there's more research needs to be done lying down, sitting up, in any different way that we could learn to scan them. Dr. Hakey, there's your challenge. Information, we're trying to gather really impractical information. So what is it that we're seeing? How important is posture anyway in our terms of our function? 
Go back to old Charlie Brown, and for those at the back who can't read that, the first upper left one says, this is my depressed stance. When you're depressed, it makes a lot of difference how you stand. The worst thing you can do is to straighten up and hold your head high because you'll start to feel better. If you're going to get any joy out of being depressed, you've got to stand like this. <laughs> So does posture make a difference? Oh my goodness, that's my life's work. And uh, what I do is uh, a technique called NUCA. NUCA is also an organization. It's the National Upper Cervical Chiropractic Association. It was founded by Dr. Ralph Gregory in 1966. I had the privilege of working with Dr. Gregory for about 10 years. He was a genius and he was a mentor to me and many others. What does NUCA do? We do a lot of things. We educate our doctors and students about how to do this procedure. And just to give you the statistical background, uh, we pulled this up recently because I was curious about it. In Canada, between medical doctors, specialists, dental, nursing practitioners, there's about 100,000 practitioners in Canada. And that doesn't include every sort of allied practitioner group. There are 30 NUCA doctors in Canada. So we are a small group. And if you think about how many people are doing vascular intervention for the treatment of MS, why are so many people having to travel to Europe, to California? There's not that many people doing it either. So again, we're really standing on the edge of something that's critically important. You know, I'm really trusting one day we're going to get a lot more support for what we're talking about today. But we are definitely working out on the edge. And when you work out on the edge, it's kind of lonely sometimes. But it doesn't mean, because we're a small group, that we don't do things that are relevant, helpful, and safe. The NUCA organization also does research, the Upper Cervical Research Foundation. I sit on that board. We provide as much public awareness. And we have a protocol that we've developed over decades that is incredibly reproducible in terms of practitioner to practitioner and patient to patient. So we w have found a way to basically put people's heads on straight. And what's attached to this protocol? I'm just going to run through that quickly with you. <clears throat> we treat what's called the atlas subluxation complex, as I said. It's basically when the head's not on straight. So our protocol is to get that correction so that the head is on straight and vertical in relationship to gravity. What we do is a, uh, it's based upon what's called, we call the restoration principle. Now within chiropractic in Canada, there's about 8,000 chiropractors and again, 30 NUCA practitioners. That, when people think of chiropractic, they think of low back pain, spinal manipulative therapy, all of those things have incredible benefit. But what we work with here is a territory of the spine that is incredibly unique in its architecture. The C12 vertebrae are the only segments in the vertebral column that do not have an intervertebral disc. The way that they are put together, articulated, the way in which they can also misalign is infinite. So the pathway of, of misalignment is so varied and so personal. The protocol that we have developed is to specifically read that personal misalignment and provide a very specific restoration to normal. All right, it's very precise. It's very subtle, it's personal, it is sustainable. And that's one thing I think that is a, incredibly valuable is that when the correction is made, it has the potential, depending on how the, uh, the patient will look after themselves, but that potential to maintain that correction over a period of months to years exists. And I'll show you the research study findings and how many times I had to adjust some of those candidates. It has an impact on the influence, and it influences the autonomic nervous system. Dr. Hakey yesterday had brought his coffee up to talk about the blood flow. I have my chamomile tea to downregulate my autonomic system. <laughs> the autonomics are so critical, and Michael Arata spoke to that, a way to influence autonomic function. There's so many things that will downregulate our autonomics. You know, and, the, and um, I'll get to this. There's so much I want to share. One of the studies that we did do within the NUCA organization was a blood pressure study published in the Journal of Hypertension in 2007. 
And we looked at a, a, a group of patients, there was a placebo group, and they, took, they all had hypertension and um, diagnosed by a cardiovascular uh, specialist. And after the Anuka care, um, they all, you know, the vast majority regulated their blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic. And then after the, the, the eight-week study, the placebo group was treated, which showed exactly similar findings. Our theory is that at this point, that it impacts the autonomic system to some degree. How and why, yet to be determined. Stay tuned. So what does the NUCA assessment and intervention look like? First thing, one of the things that we do is we look at a very simple supine leg check. So we have equipment that's designed. And the leg check, we actually did a study on the reliability of this, this leg check study. And it is very revealing. In the patient I will show you uh, her photographs of, her leg actually, leg functional, not anatomical leg discrepancy was four inches. There was a four inch functional leg discrepancy which balanced out. We see it, you know, and we measure this within our migraine headache candidates. We measure it with every patient. It is an indicator that there is compromise of the craniocervical area that is impairing postural balance. So we also have an instrument that measures posture, which is called the gravity stress analyzer. It's a mechanical instrument. Patient stands in it. We measure degree of lateral tilt, torsional twisting, lateral deviation, and forward and back. So a three-dimensional evaluation of how a posture is uh, when the patient presents. In our study, everyone did all these baseline interventions. Once we've established the fact that an atlas subluxation exists, then we proceed with a, a radiographic evaluation, a three-dimensional assessment of the location of atlas in relation to, to the skull and the lower neck. From that information, we calculate a pathway to introduce a force that will actually three-dimensionally shift the head and neck into a more aligned posture. posture. And having seen an infinite number of pre and post x-rays, and we recently uh, have completed a, an x-ray reliability study, which has looked at the inter-examiner uh, reliability of the, reading those x-rays, and the correlation between it is extremely high. We're in the process of uh, finalizing and publishing that paper as we speak. So, the safety of this is also something that's critically important uh, to gain ethics review for the University of Calgary uh, for our migraine study. Safety is obviously one of their questions. So the research that we've found and over the decades and decades of this care, there has been no long-term adverse effect attached to this care. The procedure, as all chiropractic is, is safe. It's the patient who's risky. Identifying the patient who's risky is our first and foremost challenge and priority. But in our study and in my practice experience of 35 years, I can attest to the safety of this. And I've treated some incredibly difficult vascular issues. So once we've made the initial pre-X-ray and calculated how to make the correction, provide the correction, which is a manual hands-on correction, we do a post-X-ray evaluation to determine the completeness and fullness of that correction. And my clinical experience says, the better the degree of correction, the better the patient's response. So we know that there's an optimization that does make a difference. This is my wonderful post-traumatic patient. She was hit in the head by a ski rope. She'd been under care previously. She has suffered a number of motor vehicle accidents. And when she misaligns, she gets incredibly distorted. She has severe headaches and all sorts of other neurological issues. We do the pre-X-ray analysis. The rev it reveals the lower angle, the head relationship, where the atlas is on the horizon. We make the correction. This was the same day. And I actually have a video. This is a, an interesting patient because when I adjust her, there's a particular point in which the correction's complete enough that her pelvis unwinds and balances out, and she almost falls off the table. So we have to watch her. And we all have this ongoing joke about it. Fortunately, the table's very low, and it doesn't, you know, she's never fallen off. And we've never lost a patient, though. But the post-X-rays were taken immediately after that first correction. So the adaptability and changeability of a human body, even with lots of years of trauma, is far greater than you might anticipate. So. There's her four-inch leg length in equality difference, pre- and post-posture. You know, with, uh, we're so used to watching um, 
movies with special effects and all sorts of things. It's like, do we believe some of these things? Well, you know, at the end of the day, the truth speaks for itself. The lawyers say it well, reciprocal. The thing speaks for itself, and the results of the patients have certainly said that for decades. UCRF is the Upper Cervical Research Foundation, as I say, and we took on a study recently, recently, six to ten years ago, we started designing it. Um, I guess in research world that's fast, I'm not sure. Dr. Zavidnov, he had a, um, we had an interesting conversation about that. But uh, it's our start. We are a small group and we are starting. And what we started with is having a look at migraine patients. And we knew from clinical years of experience through many offices that we had an impact on these patients' symptoms. So when we designed the study, we brought into play um, Dr. Werner Becker at the University of Calgary, who is preeminent in the area of migraines, published in excess of 80-some papers on migraines. He has done extensive amount of research on pharmacological and Botox in terms of imp and treatments. And he's, you know, to, I, I really so appreciate Dr. Becker as a true scientist who is completely open to ask the questions, does this really make a difference? And let's find out. And th the scrutiny with which we operated in terms of the study was impeccable. And his office and his department of neurology, and he runs CHAMP, which is a headache clinic at the University of Calgary Foothills Hospital. So we took patients, and they were all examined by Dr. Becker. And we ended up with 11 subjects. You know, they had to do a headache diary. We were looking for patients who had significant problems. So the demographics were these were people from anywhere from 10 to 26 headache days a month. They had these symptoms for an average of 23 years. They weren't recent things. You know, the average age was 41 years old. And so we looked at these difficult, difficult, and they were non-responsive to all the pharmacological input. You know, and every one of them. And they did not change their, their medication throughout the course of the study. So we needed to do, uh, we did their screening, neurologist screening. I made a determination to see if they actually needed NUCA care. One of the candidates did not require care. Another was dis um, had a recent mild traumatic brain injury, which uh, did not include her in the, the candidate. Then we did a baseline um, PCMRI, a phase contrast MRI. Uh, then I provided the NUCA care over a period of eight weeks. And then after that correction at uh, four weeks and eight weeks, we did another MRI. So we were looking at the primary outcome as compliance index. We had done some studies in Chicago using the similar technology, and uh, we had seen certain results with migraine patients, and we saw their compliance index go up. And so the idea is that as the compliance goes up, intracranial pressure goes down. As intracranial pressure goes up, compliance goes down. Compliance to me is another word for resilience. So compliance has been referred to many times this weekend uh, in terms of its hemo and hydrodynamic functions, but to me it really points to how resilient is that brain. Now for patients who live in Calgary particularly, uh, migraine patients, especially with our Chinook winds and the barometric pressure changes that are pretty dramatic, that was always a very common trigger. So you know, when we look at the impact of pressure and environmental changes on people, that is certainly something that we can't ignore. The secondary outcomes, though, were also the standardized gold standards of migraine patient quality of life measures. So MIDAS, the HIT-6, the MSQL. And these have been well tested and established in terms of research in migraine patients. So in this study, we did two things. We looked at their quality of life, and we were trying to understand the physiology of what went wrong or what went right. The, uh, again, the adverse reactions to care, we studied this in the inside of our, our subjects, and there was a mild neck discomfort that was reported on a scale of 3 to 10, very insignificant. It did not impair their quality of life, and there was a question regarding the satisfaction of care after one week. The median score was 10 on a scale of 0 to 10. They seemed to like it. So... When we look at the outflow patterns, again, as I mentioned, you know, MS and migraine um, have a similar patterning. And as it was mentioned, 70% of, of MS patients suffer from migraines. So again, you know, migraines falls into the neurovascular issue as well as MS. 
you know, where it goes with each person is, again, personal. Again, we, met, we talked about compliance, that relationship between flow uh, in and out of the brain. MTBI and migraines and MS, similar studies. So what does it really mean? What's going on? That's what we're trying to understand. I'm not sure that we have the definitive answer at this point, but what, we've, what we generally understand is that we need to start to discriminate these people in both whether they're primary or secondary venous drainage people. All right, so when we look at the history of mild traumatic brain injury, uh, nine out of the 11 had reported at some point early in life, many of these before age 10, experienced mild traumatic brain. Motor vehicle accidents were common. You know, and the one candidate that was non-responsive, who required the most number of corrections through the care of eight weeks, um, had both MVA and mild traumatic brain. It was a very complicated case. Across our quality of life, we saw, uh, and our, sorry, the venous drainage part, when we look at the jugular flow patients, um, the changes in compliance weren't that significant. So it didn't really sh turn out the way we thought it would turn out. Based on our work in Chicago, we thought, okay, we make the correction, compliance goes up, and they get, they, they get better. But we had all these patients who got better, but their compliance didn't change. So when we look at, you know, just another way of looking at it, you know, baseline four weeks and eight weeks, there was no big change in compliance. And okay, well, why was that? That's with the jugular flow group. When we look at the secondary venous drainage group, it's a different story. As a matter of fact, their compliance actually overall, it did go up. So what does that mean? That's the next question. What we did come to know is that compliance not, isn't really what we thought it might be in terms of what influences it. It's not this sort of linear thing that, you know, as one thing goes up, another thing goes down. It's a very complicated system. And it seems, and as some of the research that was presented here, uh, CSF flow has a lot to do with intracranial compartment, both volume and velocity and all sorts of things that are changing there. And what I've come to understand is that compliance uh, is a function of, uh, of pressure and um, velocity of pressure and volume. And so you can have a change um, in two of those different things and still end up with the same compliance number. So, you know, I am not an expert in neuroimaging and flow studies. Thank goodness in this room and in the world we have people who are. What I am interested in is the thing that makes the difference in terms of patient outcomes. And when I look at, you know, the postural changes that occurred, um, this, this chart really reflects, you know, before and after. Uh, we, the accumulative index for the GSA, uh, normal value we say should fall somewhere between 0 and 5, 0 to 7 degrees as a total de deviation. Um, the mean for the, the sample group was 31 degrees off. That was a fair, that's an excessive amount of postural deviation. So we know that there's dysfunction going on. Following the correction, that reduced down to a mean of three. We have the x-ray information that we also measured, and we have put that into our database, and we're looking at analyzing that. The one thing that I can say is that one of the most predominant factors has to do with the dimension of not the lateral movement of the C1 vertebrae, but the rotational part of C1 and C2. Those rotational components seem to have the greatest impact on the outcomes. And it's my theory to be tested further is that that is the thing that obstructs outflow of CSF. So as blood and volume goes into the brain on the cardiac cycle, CSF should exit out through the base of the skull into the C1, C2 area down the spine. With the misalignment, that doesn't seem to happen. And so what we have is with the correction, there seems to be changes and there's need for further study and more understanding of CSF flow patterns. So what have we concluded? You know, there's many um, 
ways in which the blood will go in and out of that brain, and it's quite varied. We need more information. But there does seem to be those similar patterns across mild traumatic brain, MS, and migraine. Nuka has a beneficial impact. We know from our quality of life, we don't have all the analysis in yet, even for the flow studies. And we're looking at even redoing some of that flow study information using uh, different technology. So the question is, how did we get that way? You know, uh, is it possible that mild traumatic brain was one of the mechanical starts to this whole sequence, and it happened early in life? but it was never looked at, it was never corrected, it was never taken care of. So we need a more dynamic study. So when we look at living our lives and trying to maintain our physiology, the resilience of the physiology is, seems to be a key consideration. You know, and the ways in which we can measure that are evolving as technology evolves. One of the researchers that I'm familiar with personally is Dr. Sonia Lupian in Montreal. And she's spent 25 years or more looking at the impact of chronic stress on the human body. So when the stress response mechanism is activated and the autonomics release a, a rush of a variety of biochemical hormones and things, cortisol being one of them is what she's measured. And Dr. Arada was talking about as well as a marker. But her work is in terms of um, measuring cortisol levels. And what she said, to many, uh, to, to the world and to me personally, is that the opposite of stress isn't relaxation, it's resilience. And so what's needed is a, a resilient adaptive neurology and capacity of the human body to operate in an optimal way. So we do have this intelligence system, as I talked about, homeostasis is our natural drive towards equilibrium. Allostasis, which is the allostatic load model, looks at What's the capacity of the individual to maintain that stability while under load? And if we put two 25 kilo items on a teeter-totter, we can create some balance and harmony. But what happens if it's 400 kilos? What's the physiology going to be like? And we're Canadians, we're used to skating. So the thickness of the ice is the equivalent of the physiology. The load that the ice has to carry is another story. What happens is so much, because of so many things, compromising the resilient adaptive capacity, the ice gets very thin, and the load gets very high. And we live in a world that's a lot more complex and demanding, both environmentally and neurologically. And so the load is so high that eventually it starts to crack, the physiology shakes, and we end up with these conditions and diseases. So what do we do to maintain our allostatic capacity in homeostasis? So the integrative things. And it is completely an integrative problem. And so we look at, and, and there's so much detail, we could spend a week on each one of these things. But there's seven things that we, uh, we, this is our foundational pieces that we use in our clinic. And it's about building a more resilient, adaptive individual. The first thing is the alignment. Our relationship to gravity is one of the most important. The energy that's consumed in our relationship to gravity is immense. So if our body is distorted as we move through time and space, the degenerative process that causes the breakdown of the connective tissue of the spine, as well as the other joints in the body, it progresses as we age. So the alignment, how we are in relationship to gravity is central. It's the first and foundational piece. And as our research is revealing more in terms of vascular hemodynamic changes, we'll ever be able to say more specifically what the impact is on that our capacity to breathe and breathe deeply. It's also one of the best practices for uh, downloading or down-regulating the autonomics. Meditation, it's talked about. I mean, there's so many things within our capability to help support our neurology. Hydration is an essential piece. The quality of water and the quantity that we drink, extremely important. The rest that we get, both physical rest and cognitive rest. The problem is that with the subluxation complex, with all these other pathophysiological things going on, as you've noticed and you know firsthand, sleep disturbance is a common issue. One of the best things that people benefit from, from getting their head on straight, is they sleep better. 
And so the cognitive strain as well, with the introduction of technology today, our brain neurology is under a load that is unparalleled in decades previously. The ability to unplug from that technology in the world of the, you know, the corporate world, you know, the ability to have a weekend off or an evening off no longer exists. The ability to unplug from work and the responsibilities of problem solving and cognitive load are huge. Kids with mild traumatic brain injury, the screen time limitations are a key part of their treatment. They cannot be on a screen because their brain cannot keep up with the data that it's trying to process. So the rest that we get physically and cognitively is essential. Movement, I don't like to call it exercise. I personally hate exercise. And I really value the ability to move. So what does movement mean? You know, it means walking, stretching. Obviously, it's got to meet you where you are, and you need to meet it where it's at. But it doesn't mean hyper-intense types of things. It's movement practices. It was talked about Tai Chi, yoga. Those are movement practices. So if you do nothing else, keep moving. And if you move from a balanced posture and a center of gravity that is absolutely in your favor, your movement patterns are going to be radically different and beneficial to your system. Nutrition, how long can we spend on that? You know, I mean, this is such a huge world and such an important piece to supporting allostas allostatic load capacity and homeostasis. And the next thing is finding meaning in what you're doing. At every station of life, every stage, the question of meaning comes forward. And it'll come forward in a different way for every one of us. But it's critical that you find an intersection with whatever's most meaningful to you that makes a difference in your life, that renews you in a way that enables you to continue your journey, whichever way that might go. It's a critical part. And taking the time to reflect on that, taking the time to be in touch with what's meaningful for you is no longer optional in my mind. It's an essential part of every day to make sure you're on path, your path, which is unique to you. And the world needs you just the way you are. So this personal mystery of MS, the MS mystery, and it is, and there's nothing that human beings hate more than ambiguity. We want answers, you know, and science is working so hard, and I see it this weekend. We're working so hard to make sure that the patients and the people who aren't in the science, but are looking for support, we find those answers to remove some of the ambiguity. You know, is it a life sentence? I don't think so. I think sometimes a diagnosis can be a real trap. It can stick you to, you know, this is gonna be the way it goes for me. And I'll go back to one of those first things, is the body is always in a state of change. Depending on the environment and how you support it will make the difference on how it unfolds. Yes, there's a genetic influence, but there's also the conversations and research around epigenetics, Bruce Lipton and others. The environment impacts the genetic coding and outcomes as much as is that the old argument. And here's another area of controversy, all right? Nature or nurture, it's both. We don't need to split them. So if we can't change the hand we're dealt, let's support it the best ways that we know how. And it is going to be a very, very loud call for you to step into your life just the way it is. But doing it with a degree of compassion and curiosity, dedication, and trust that things will show up. And they are showing up in terms of the research and the care. It may not be that prevalent at this point, but it doesn't mean that it's not happening. These are very difficult cases to you know, um, talk about. They're very difficult cases to diagnose. We don't have all the answers, but we have enough to work with that clinically, anecdotally, or not, practically shows up in a very meaningful way for many, many people. So what I wanted to offer you was maybe a couple different things to look at, a different way. You know, ask some questions in a different way. You know, but together, you know, as we continue to work, and I will say it again, and I really applaud this organization for its dedication to integrative research. It's the only way I think we'll find an answer to this challenging series of questions. 
not to one condition, but to the human condition. And the answers that we can bring forward is a collaborative effort. And again, privileged to be at a dinner last night to share in these kind of conversations. You know, this is a real meaningful, meaningful and important conversation. So I thank you all for your attention this morning and the opportunity to be here to share this with you. Thank you very much.